Hey, deserving listeners, I want to talk to you about Salvador Mnuchin. He died recently, and I've received a number of emails and other requests from other people to talk about Salvador Mnuchin, not only, not only because he's a major figure in psychotherapy, particular fam, particularly family therapy, but he also died recently, and it's you know, sort of customary to do a episode on a major figure if there's some kind of event like that. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, Salvador Mnuchin was one of the major role models for me. He he was just so inspiration, inspirational to watch. He, he has a lot of filmed demonstrations in, in which he works with fa- actual families, actual clients, and He just has this really uh, attractive way of being a therapist, I think particularly to trainees, because he wasn't afraid to be different as a therapist, and yet he was always professional, you know. Carl Whitaker also wasn't afraid of being different, but sometimes Carl Whitaker would not be very professional in my opinion. But Salvador Mnuchin sort of rode that line very well. He, He... was spontaneous. He was kind of weird at times, but he was professional. You always knew that he was, he was a therapist. He always dressed in suits and he was always, you know, tidy, even though he was being filmed in the sixties and seventies when a lot of people weren't dressed nice or tidy at the time. (laughs) Uh, I mean, all you have to do is watch a a lot of these old videos or, you know, they would have been on film back then of demonstrations of therapy in the 60s and 70s to to see kind of interesting fashion trends. Uh, Incidentally, actually, um, whenever I show therapy sessions, even from like the 90s or the aughts, that my students always chuckle at the the hair and the... the, um, the fashion at the time. But anyway, Salvador Mnuchin was extremely clever as a, as a therapist, and yet he wasn't arrogant. And he often, in these demonstrations, would have like 10 family members in the room. So just seeing him work was just so amazing, amazing because he, he what would happen is he would travel to a town and he'd be having a training with hundreds of people attending the training. And then he would ask someone to bring their family into the training and they would go to another room and there would be a closed circuit camera where everyone could watch the session in the other room. And these families would sign, you know, waivers, I assume, Uh, who knows if that was even around back then, but the family knew that they were being watched by hundreds of people in in the room next door. And and so Mnuchin would just, you know, waltz in real relaxed and, and just proceed to have this amazing family therapy session, even though he knows he's being filmed, even though he knows people in the next room are watching and he's going to have to justify his his actions later on in, in the day to all these hundreds of people. And he just would walk in and everything was just, he was just super cool and and he did this over and over and over again, and, and it, it was it was just amazing to watch. Um, to me, I, I, you, you got Salvador Mnuchin and you have Virginia Satir. These are the, my grandparents of family therapy. Um, I, I consider Harry Stack Sullivan to, to be a grandfather and also Nathan Ackerman to be another great, great grandfather, but I don't. I don't think any other prominent figure really inspires me as much as Mnuchin and Satir. I mean, I mean, I. I don't think there's any uh, recorded work of Sullivan or Ackerman because that was too long ago. I'm guessing. Anyway, but there's a fair amount of of filmed therapy sessions with actual clients with Mnuchin and Satir, and I really can't think of any other prominent figures who inspire me more than they do. Uh, there, whenever I watch them, I'm like, man, you know, that is inspirational work and the risks that they take and how brave they are and how they focus on the core of the issue so quickly, particularly Satir, really. Um, you know, all the other figures don't inspire me the way that Mnuchin and Satir do. Not Jay Haley, not Milton Erickson, not DeShazer, not Insu, not Framo, not Watzlawick, not Chloe Medanis, not Scharf, not White, not Bateson, not Whitaker. Well, like I said, maybe Whitaker. 
Not Nichols, not Swartz, not Lyman Wynn, not Don Jackson, not Murray Bowen, not Boscolo, not Napier, not Naj, not, um, not Ackerman, because I haven't seen any of his um, work. And um, Aponte, maybe Harry Aponte, his work is inspirational, but not nearly as much as Mnuchin and Satir. Anyway, so Mnuchin is really up there for me in terms of um, people that when I watch their sessions, I'm like, huh, that's that's good. Because there's a fair amount of sessions that I watch from prominent figures that I actually don't understand why they are doing the things they do. Like Sue Johnson is known for emotion-focused therapy. And when I watch her sessions, I'm always like, what? Like her, her theory is great. And I have been using it before I even knew what it was uh, I was using a form of attachment-based therapy before that anyway. And so I respect the theory, and, and I, th I respect a lot of its ideas, and, and a lot of the people who use it, I think, are using it really well. But the demonstrations I've seen Sue Johnson uh, film, I'm always like, whoa, Like this doesn't feel like the theory to me. It feels like she's doing something else. But um, anyway, so it's just... She, you know, uh, Mnuchin is just up there in terms of for me, um, and others love him too. He he's the most famous family therapist in my opinion by far. Uh, today, his model is probably the most popular model of family therapy. It's used around the globe, um, and uh, you know uh, the evidence of how much he's loved is when he would do these trainings, some of them were filmed and some of them you can actually watch on YouTube or on DVD. And it's amazing to see the crowds react to him. I mean, he was a god in family therapy. He, when, when he talked, people were riveted. And, and when people asked him questions, you could just tell how, how much they worshiped this guy. It was, it was, it's interesting to watch. Um, and also, a, a very important thing and respectable thing is that he's well known for focusing on marginalized groups throughout his career, which was very different at the time. You know, while most therapists were recording, you know, filming their sessions with middle class, upper class people, Mnuchin was recording sessions with the poorest families in the United States, and he was focusing on working with those kinds of clients. Imagine being famous for helping the most marginalized families around the world. I mean, how many therapists can say that? Harry Aponte, but, you know, he was a student of Mnuchin. So uh, so it's just, you know, when you think of Freud, you don't think, oh, throughout his career, all he did was work with extremely poor immigrants. You just don't think of that uh, with, with Freud. You know, you think of upper class people who could afford psychoanalysis. And uh, but Mnuchin is just well known for saying, "Look, there's this model called family therapy, and you know, family therapists, you really need to focus on working with marginalized groups because not only are they suffering from all the kinds of normal family dysfunctions, but they also are suffering from massive oppression from the outside, and they they need our help, and they deserve our help." and And not only did he just talk about it, but he actually did it. He actually throughout his life worked, uh, you know, in the room with actual poor families and, and people of color. And so it's, it's an amazing thing to see where, you know, you would imagine that a lot of people, as they gain prominence, they would start to work with richer people because they could make more money, you know? So, so that's what I want to talk about today. But before I do that, let's introduce the podcast. This is the podcast called Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm also a professor at Antioch University Seattle in the Couple and Family Therapy Program in which we train licensed marriage and family therapists. Today, I'm going to talk about the history of Salvador Mnuchin, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, according to my notes here, I'm guessing it'll take me probably a couple hours just to talk about the history. And then after that, I'm going to do a patron-only deep dive on Mnuchin's theory. So if you're listening to this on the regular feed, I'm going to talk about all the history for everyone. But then after that, I'm going to end and, and only patrons can listen to uh, the theory on, on the deep dive. Okay, so let's get into the history here. Salvador Mnuchin, a lot of people called him Sal, by the way. His friends and family called him Sal. 
He was born in 1921 in San Salvador, Argentina. He is the first of three children. He reportedly had a quote-unquote strict and fair father. His father owned a small business in Argentina. He, his mother was reportedly very protective of him, and she ran the household. He had a large extended family, and he lived in a close-knit community of immigrant Russian Jews. So apparently a lot of Russian Jews moved to Argentina, and they built a small community in San, San Salvador, Argentina. The town was actually one quarter uh, immigrant Russian Jews. So, you know, a pretty s- substantial group in that town. However, uh, the anti-Semitism was, was rampant around the world, and Argentina was no exception to that. So in his community, he definitely felt the anti-Semitism in his community. In 1930, when he was nine years old, his, fa- his father lost the family business as a result of the Great Depression, and the family became poor very quickly. And he had to, as evidence of this, he had had to help his mother sell produce to make money for the family, even though he was just nine years old. So then the family business was rebuilt later, but this time his uncle was in charge, and the hierarchy of the family shifted from his father to his uncle. And when, you know... um, when, for example, when the uncle would come to dinner, the uncle would displace his father at the head, head <coughs> at the head of the table. So it's apparent to me that his early experiences in childhood would plant the seeds for his later theory, because you can you can see the beginnings of his ideas of what a functional family should look like. He had strict parents, but they were also fair parents. And he definitely promoted that idea with his families later. There seems to be clear roles for people that that adjust when needed, right? So his role as a nine-year-old shifted to one of helping the family earn money because that's what the family needed. And then when the family didn't need that anymore, his 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 role shifted back. Um, I, I'm sort of basing this on pretty limited information, but anyway. Um, he also had contact with his extended family, so this this instilled a uh, an extended family approach to his to his work later on. Mutual support was important. An understanding of the family's context, right? Anti-Semitism, poverty, an understanding of family setbacks when the Great Depression happened and his family became very poor. All of these things would seemingly plant the seeds for his later theory. Okay, skipping forward to 1940, at age 18, he finishes high school and he enters medical school. So a very interesting choice for a young Sal Mnuchin. 1944, still in medical school during World War II, a right-wing military group overthrew the elected government of Argentina, and universities were placed under the control of the state under this military group. Mnuchin joined his classmates and resisted this state control. So they, they were like, no, we don't want the state involved because that will be bad for education. And Mnuchin was arrested by the authorities and spent three months in prison <laughs> which is uh, interesting. He was also expelled from the university because the state now ran the university, but he was readmitted later, thank God. So it's an interesting situation there. It's like, what would have happened if he was truly kicked out of medical school? Because he never would have likely become what he was if he didn't get his medical degree. In 1946, age 24, he graduates with his medical degree, and he decides to specialize in pediatrics, working with children. There was more political strife in Argentina. Also around this time, the state of Israel was created after World War II, right? And pretty quickly, Israel started fighting with its neighbors and had a lot of war problems right away. So in 1948, Mnuchin joined the Israeli army as a physician. Presumably, this is where he discovered his, his passion for psychiatry and psychotherapy, because I'm guessing he noticed that 
because he was a he was a pediatrician, right? So he's working with children in Israel, and I'm guessing he noticed that a lot of the kids were traumatized and not only needed uh, you know medical help, but they also needed psychological help. Before, um, or sorry, be, uh, after the war, Mnuchin very quickly uh, went to New York to train as a child psychiatrist. So you know, very, so he's like a pediatrics physician, and then he goes to Israel and he works with all these children, and he's, he notices that they've been traumatized, and I, you know, he's like, huh, maybe I should really be looking into child psychiatry. So he goes to New York to study that, and he stud- studies under Nathan Ackerman, I think, which I said before is, is in my opinion, the great-grandfather of family therapy. He, uh, Mnuchin worked with psychotic children in New York, and in New York he met Patricia Pitluck, a developmental psychologist who he would later marry and be married to for a very long time. In 1951, at age 30, he went back to Israel to help out. He helped run a residential therapy agency or a number of residential therapy agencies for children who were suffering from trauma. The trauma was from the Holocaust, from World War II. So, you know, children who survived the the camps in in the, in the prisons in Germany, Nazi Germany, fled to Israel and were suffering from trauma. And so, Mnuchin helped out with those kids. And also, there are a number of children in Israel who had fled from other countries in Asia and the Middle East and were also traumatized. And so he helped them with that as well. And so this was when he learned how important it was to work with families. So he, he noticed, like, these, these families have been through something together. It's not just this one kid. And he also realized that you have to take context into consideration when you're thinking about, quote-unquote, individual psychotherapy. Because remember at the time, and really even today, Whenever someone's depressed or anxious, we tend to think of it as an individual problem. Well, Mnuchin at the time, this, this is starting to form his ideas about family therapy. He's starting to say, like, you know, really, it's not just this one person. It's the whole family. The whole family needs to come into therapy. He, Mnuchin and his wife had a child, and they returned to the United States. This is in the 50s. And he wanted to study the ideas of Harry Stack Sullivan, who had just recently died in 1949. So Mnuchin was attracted to Sullivan. Uh, I'm uh, I'm unclear why, but I'm guessing why. I'm guessing I know why because Harry Stack Sullivan is is one of my favorite early figures in psychoanalysis. Whenever I read Sullivan's ideas, it sounds like someone that would be writing today. So I'm guessing that's why Mnuchin went to New York to study the ideas of Harry Stack Sullivan at at an institute that taught, you know, Sullivan's ideas. Because I think Sullivan might have taught there prior to passing away. Sullivan was very relational and and systemic and multicultural. Um, He was an American psychoanalyst, and he was the child of Irish immigrants. And at the time, being being a child uh, of of Irish immigrants was akin to, you know, being African American in some ways. People were very hateful towards Irish Catholics in the early 20th century and and before then as well. Um, And he grew up in a town that, that was dominated by Protestants, American Protestants, who hated Irish Catholics. Um, Sullivan is considered to be the founder of interpersonal psychodynamic therapy, which is my primary therapy therapy theory. Some it's related to intersubjectivity, relational therapy, object relations, etc. So, so Sullivan really is is, uh, and he's the great grandfather of both, in my view, family therapy and interpersonal therapy, which are my two main integrated theories. Sullivan was way before his time. And to, even though Harry Stack Sullivan isn't considered as such, I consider him to be, to, in some respects, the very first family therapist. Some people would say Adler would be the very first family therapist, of which I you know, wouldn't argue with you. 
Um, so, so if you go Adler, Sullivan, um, these two are considered to be psychoanalysts, and they're they're not often can they're not often included in family therapy history books, but I think they should be. I mean, when I first read Harry Stack Sullivan, I kept writing in the margins of my book, "Why doesn't family therapy claim this guy as our great grandfather? He's amazing." Um, we claim Nathan Ackerman, who was also a psychoanalyst. Ackerman is often held up as uh, you know one of the early pioneers to start family therapy ideas, but why not Sullivan? It's it's weird. Um, Sullivan is is considered to be firmly within the field of psychoanalysis, which is fine. But again, when you read his writings, I, I think he could he he had he had definitely had one foot in psychoanalysis, but I think he had another foot firmly in what would later become family systems theory. Um, in that he was really interested in relationships and attachment, and he was pretty vocal about rejecting the Freudian classic, you know, the classic Freudian psychoanalytic ideas. So, so Mnuchin wanted to study the ideas of Harry Stack Sullivan. He had already studied Ackerman, and, and so he was attracted to Sullivan as well, and he joined the William Allenson White Institute in uh, New York to um, study the ideas of Sullivan. Okay, skipping forward to 1957. After completing his psychoanalytic training under the ideas of Sullivan, um, so remember he was first in medical school, then he chose to work with child medicine, and then he decided to work with child psychiatry, and now he <clears throat> and now he is trained as a, as a psycho um, an analysis person psychoanalyst, which was pretty much, if pretty much if you wanted to work in psychotherapy at the time, that was the only option you had. Up until probably the 60s and 70s, you know, if, if you wanted to become a psychotherapist, you became a psychoanalysis, a psychoanalyst, because that's just, that's just the way the profession was at the time. So that's what he did. But he, but he chose the psychoanalytic training that was most related to what we would call today to be family systems theory. theory. And he, uh, so he's done with his psychoanalytic training, and he worked as a child psychiatrist at the, at the Wiltswick School for Delinquent Boys. So this is a residential school for troubled boys. There, he learned that psychoanalysis was not very practical for the general population, you know, in which you have several hours of psycho, uh, of a, uh, free association and this sort of thing. He, so, so he and his colleagues at the Wiltswick School for Delinquent Boys decided to break from psychoanalysis and try to develop a brand new theory for working with these families. And they noticed that when they successfully treated the child and sent the child back to their family, they noticed that the symptoms reemerged in that child. This is similar to other psychoanalysts at the time, like Murray Bowen and Naj and these people, they were noticing the same thing uh, in other areas. I don't know if they knew about each other, but there was a, a very small realization in the field of psychotherapy where it was like, wait a second, you know, when we treat people, uh, we succeed, but then when we send them back to their family systems, all of our work goes away and they return to the exact same symptoms. Like, what's going on here? Around the same time, general systems theory from biology and cybernetics from computers were influencing the field of psychotherapy. Uh, things, ideas like whole systems, feedback, and homeostasis and stuff. Um, you know, in it with with whole general systems theory, the idea it's complicated, but the idea is is that in there was a movement to reduce everything to atoms, right? It's like it's you know we. You know, what are the atoms that comprise things? You have hydrogen and helium and oxygen and carbon. And there was this, there was this movement to, in order to, you know, science was really trying to reduce things to its fundamental parts as a way of trying to discover, the, discover nature. But there were people in biology who were like, you know, that, that's great. You know, sure, you know, study the atoms. But really, in order to understand biology, it seems like a better way, a better model is 
general systems theory, which is in which you understand the system of biology. For example, with a cell, if you have any knowledge of cellular biology, you know that in a typical cell, you have just tons of different things that are there. <laughs> you have DNA and RNA and mitochondria and the cell wall, and you have all these like, you know, little molecules that Tra you know, and proteins and amino acids. I might be using all my words wrong here, but the point is, is that when you really learn all the inner workings of a typical cell, you you realize that it is a mess of weirdness. And if you just understood its atoms, like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon and you know hydrogen, you you don't understand the cell. You have to understand how. And also, if you just understand DNA, that that only gives you part of the picture. You really need to understand the whole system. You need, you need, to, you need to understand RNA and, and the cell wall and then the proteins and how everything works together, and then you understand the cell. So that was a movement in biology. And then you had this movement in, in computers, early computer understanding, in, in, in which the idea of cybernetics, in which you have a self-correcting system the I, you know, one of the things that they were working on at the time in the military was missiles that could drive themselves. You know, missile because you know early on missiles you just fired them like the in World War II. Um, uh, Hitler had these rockets that he would launch t at at London, and the idea was like, look, you don't you don't have to have a plane to bomb London. You could just fire these rockets. Well. They were they were they were not guided. You just sort of guessed as to how to launch it to make it land where you wanted it to land, and it was and they would they would be wildly off at times. Well, what they were trying to find was how do you find a a a, a system using computers on a missile that can guide it toward your target? And one of the things that they uh, started to develop was feedback mechanisms. So so it's like you you are headed, you know, the, you, the missile is headed toward the target and the computer on the missile figures out how to keep homeostasis, how to keep it, how to keep it moving in toward the target. And so if wind happens or, um, you know, something kind of pushes it off course, there's a feedback mechanism that will push it back to, to, to stability and keep it on target. And so these ideas of cybernetics were also in the air, and um, fam and psychoanalysts uh, and people who interested in family therapy, like um, l like uh, Salvador Mnuchin, started to look at systems theory and cybernetics as a way of trying to understand families. And so they're like, you know, we can't understand uh, people by t taking one person, you know. In the same way, you can't understand a cell by just looking at DNA. You have to look at the whole system. You have to look at the whole cell and all the components. You have to look at the whole family and all the people in the family. The other thing that was influencing early family therapy people was this idea of cybernetics and in computers and the idea of feedback mechanisms and the idea that when a system starts to uh, fall out of its normal course, there are feedback mechanisms to push it back to stability. And it was thought that family systems and their dysfunctions were partially, or if, if not wholly, uh, determined by these feedback mechanisms that kept the family in a, in a stable place, but in a dysfunctional stable place. And whenever you tried to push that family to a, to a better uh, state of functioning, the the family system and and the larger context would, of the culture and society had all these feedback mechanisms to push the family back to its state, even though it's a dysfunctional state because systems like stability and homeostasis. Anyway, so so around this time, it, a lot of people were being influenced, or very a, a, a few number of early family therapy people were being influenced by this idea also influenced by Nathan Ackerman and Harry Stack Sullivan and other people. And so this is early family therapy ideas, Murray, Bowen, Naj, Bateson, and also Mnuchin and his colleagues. 
And Mnuchin also started to notice that there were family life stages, not just individual life stages. So normally, you know, you have individual life stages like when you're in preschool, you go through these kinds of things. When you become an adolescent, you go through puberty. And when you become an adult, you do these kinds of things. Well, Mnuchin and his colleagues started realizing, well, not only are there individual stages, but there's also family stages. There's the coupling phase between the parents. There's the, you know, having children. There's the um, late adulthood. You know, there's all these kinds of um, stages that they started to discover and, and describe. Their method at the time, at the, at the Wiltswick School in New York, you know, residential place for boys, troubled boys, and him and his colleagues, their, their method involved Mnuchin or another psychiatrist performing a therapy session with a family while other psychiatrists viewed the session through a one-way mirror. So this was this was um, very influential on Mnuchin for throughout his career and to family therapy. Mnuchin and other people would observe their colleagues work with families through this one-way mirror, and this allowed them to learn techniques from each other and provide guidance to each other. I would love to do this honestly, but uh, as as a trainer myself and as a therapist myself, but it's it's often too strange for people to do it's just and and it requires a fair amount of effort and facility the facility has to have it and it's it's also i think kind of expensive because imagine when you you know when today when you go when so some a family comes to me and works with me well they have to pay me right or someone has to pay me their insurance or an agency or you know someone's got to pay for my time well imagine having to pay for five other therapists also to sit behind a one-way mirror and watch the whole thing you've just you know times your fee by six so instead of 150 dollars an hour you're now at what twelve hundred dollars or nine hundred dollars an hour nine hundred dollars an hour as opposed to 150 dollars an hour that's you know cost prohibitive plus insurance companies would never pay for something like that because they have their own rules about stuff like that so so Mnuchin, but apparently, so apparently they had funding to do this at the time, which is was wonderful for them. <laughs> so after eight years of doing this at the Wiltswick School for Boys, Mnuchin and his colleagues, they developed their own theory, which would eventually be called structural family therapy, structural family therapy. Now, I just want to emphasize that, that their, Mnuchin and his colleagues, their achievements cannot be overstated. The idea of treating the family instead of the individual is so strange, even today, that for them to have done this in the 50s is just incredible. Um, you know, and to, to look at society and culture and marginalization as a cause of psychological problems is, again, it's, that's avant-garde today let alone in the 50s, right? You know, we're talking the conformist 50s. This is, this is you know, extremely cutting-edge stuff, again, even for today, way before its time, um, which really just drives me crazy that we're still, in 2018, trying to convince our field not only to pay attention to the family system, you know, it, as a, as a family therapist and an individual therapist, I absolutely focus on individual psychopathology and individual issues for sure. But I also look at the family system and I also try to look at, the, at society and culture. And this is, was absolutely considered fringe at the time and still is considered fringe. And it's just bizarre that even today, we, you know, the, our, the vast majority in our field focus on the individual. Insurance companies focus on that. I mean, I, I have I have supervisees who um, are all of my supervisees struggle with paperwork because we still look at a file as being for one client, not for a family. Um, and in some ways, it's going backwards. In my opinion, it seems to be. It's I, again, it's just anecdotal, but it seems like our field is focusing even less on family systems and culture and, and even more on individuals, which is driving me crazy. Okay, 
So actually, let's, let's, let's take a break and when we get back, let's continue the history of Salvador Minuchin. <music> All right, we're back from the break. Uh, we're going to talk about the history of Salvador Mnuchin. I'm going to continue that. And then at the end of that, I'm going to talk about his theory, of which is only for patrons. So um, get ready for that. All right, 1960s. We're, we're in the 1960s now. And Mnuchin is in his 40s. And this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the time, the decade in which Mnuchin became very popular. So in the 50s, he was just an unknown guy, with working with some of his friends in New York at this, at this, at this school for boys, and and they're they're, you know, breaking away from psychoanalysis and and trying to be more pragmatic and and slowly developing structural family therapy. Well, in the '60s, this is when he became really popular. He became popular for his theory, but really, in my opinion, mostly he became popular because of of his filmed sessions. He would film his sessions. Um, which was very easy to do because again they're behind a one-way mirror, right? And and there was this there was this culture of watching each other work, and so I, I'm guessing that led to huh, well why don't we just film these sessions, get the permission of the client, and show these at trainings to help people? Well, these films got out to the to other therapists and clinicians were fascinated by his film de- demonstrations. Mnuchin in these, like I was saying earlier, he, he's just so easygoing and he's so likable and he, he's very honest about his observations about these families. And honestly, I, I think his accent has, has something to do with it. He, he has an Argentinian accent. And although, you know, he spoke English pretty well, um, you know, it was, it was a noticeable accent, and I think he could get away with saying outrageous things to families because he had an accent. You, you know, when you hear someone having an accent, your expectations of their ability to speak English exactly well goes down, right? You're just like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're probably going to screw up some words, no big deal. And so Mnuchin could say these just outrageous things, and I think American families would hear this and they'd be like, well, he just doesn't know how to sugarcoat his words because he's a foreigner, <laughs> which might have been true. I don't know, but he he would say these just really outrageous things, and I, um, and and it and it was very appealing uh, to therapists at the time, and and was very appealing to me when I was being trained watching him in the '90s. You know, he he would just turn to families and be like, you know, so. Um, so is this how you want to be for the rest of your life? Is this, you know, is this cool? Do you, do you like to fight all the time? Is You know, I mean, I'm not providing a very good example, but anyway, you just really have to watch it. I really encourage you to, there are videos on YouTube that you can watch. And if you're a part of a training program, they very likely have, you know, a dozen or so DVDs you can watch or online videos that are paid for. Now, having said all that, I think there was something a little nefarious about his popularity because you know therapists throughout history have in my opinion been insecure about their work and also have countertransference right where you end up especially with families end up you end up being kind of resentful or hurt and angry towards families, you know, because families are very stressful to work with, especially if you're accustomed to working with individuals. You know, the individual person comes into therapy and complains about their spouse and their kids and their parents. And it's very easy as a therapist to build up a lot of countertransference and anger and because you're being triangulated towards the family members. And so it was very common for therapists, I think, even today, to 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 just have a bias for their client against their families. I find that to be a very hacky thing to do consciously. It's it's fine to have the countertransference, but it's another thing to go along with it, which I find a lot of therapists do, which really drives me crazy. But anyway, it's a, a common thing. And so I think when Mnuchin, so Mnuchin, his approach to families, he was just so easygoing and he would call families out on their crap. He would just point it out. He'd just be like, you know, he would turn to the kid and he'd be like, so it looks like you're rebelling because um, you enjoy it, you know. Or he'd turn to the parents and he'd be like, so it looks like you 
are kind of encouraging your kid to be rebellious. It, you know, what do you get out of your of your kid uh, being rebellious? What do you get out of that? And so Mnuchin would just would just confront people head on. He wouldn't dance around things. He would just tell them. And I think that at the time and even today. When therapists watch this, it, it gives them some sort of sick pleasure because Mnuchin is, in a sense, being passive aggressive with his families. Now, of course, if you're in love with Mnuchin, you're going to say, in no way is Mnuchin being passive aggressive. But, you know, you could make an argument for it sometimes. Or at the very least, you could make an argument that people watching would get some sort of passive aggressive pleasure from watching a family get their just dessert. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, anyway. So I think that led... So anyway, he became very popular in the 60s from his his demonstrations that were filmed. Also in the 60s, early 60s, he travels to Palo Alto, which was a sort of mecca. In addition to New York and Philadelphia, Palo Alto, California was a mecca for family therapy, and he went there to work with Jay Haley. So he's he's... He's worked with Ackerman, he's, he's taught in the ways of Sullivan, and now he's going to work with the renowned Jay Haley in Palo Alto at the famous Mental Research Institute. There, there were many main figures of family therapy that had worked there and were working there at the time, which is just amazing to think about. Don Jackson, Paul Watzlawick, Chloe Medanis, Mara Medanis, uh, Richard Fish, Jules Riskin, Virginia Satir, R.D. Lang, Irvin Yellum, and others had at some point done a stint there, including Salvador Mnuchin. And Mnuchin and Jay Haley in Palo Alto became best friends. <laughs> um, Mnuchin wrote that Jay Haley was his most important teacher. He wrote that Jay Haley was a man who was, quote, forever pushing the envelope and, quote, testing the limits of new ideas. Mnuchin really appreciated this about Jay Haley, you know. So again, remember at the time, uh, Mnuchin still doesn't really have a firm theory yet. He's still basically kind of developing it, and he goes to the Mecca in Palo Alto, and the renowned Jay Haley kind of gives him his, his final push to really solidify his ideas. Mnuchin said that his friendship, his relationship with Jay Haley was like the the relationship between Spock and Captain Kirk from Star Trek. Uh, now, remember, you know, this is in the 60s, so Trek was on TV at the time, not on reruns, which is just mind-blowing to me. And they apparently, or at least Mnuchin, apparently watched Star Trek at the time, which I think uh, makes me like Mnuchin even more. And Jay Haley was like Spock. You know, he was very intellectual and logical, while Mnuchin was like Captain Kirk in that, Mnuchin was very pragmatic, and he took action, and, you know, so he saw the two of them like Spock and Kirk. <laughs> so Jay Haley's model was known as, or became known as, strategic family therapy, and Mnuchin's model became known as structural family therapy, and this was when, because they were besties, this was when structural and strategic really started to influence each other. And today, I find structural and strategic to be very similar in, in practice. They have different theories and different um, foundations, but I find that it's hard for me to distinguish a structural family therapist from a strategic family therapist when I see them actually operating. And I think it's partially, if not wholly, because Mnuchin and Jay Haley were such good friends and influenced each other's work so much. Okay, so 1965... He was appointed director of the Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic. So he goes to Philadelphia. He, you know, uh, leaves Palo Alto. Um, I'm not sure if he lived in Palo Alto or he just went there to study temporarily. But anyway, he goes to Philadelphia and he's appointed a director of the Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic, which is quite an honor, you know, to, to be a director of a, of a child clinic. Um, again, yet another major figure who found themselves in Philadelphia, because Philadelphia, uh, in addition to Palo Alto, was a, a major center for family therapy, similar to Naj, as I talked about in another deep dive. Jay Haley went with him, went with Mnuchin, 
and became one of Mnuchin's uh, staff members. So that'd be interesting, right? So, so Mnuchin goes to Jay Haley to be trained, and look, and Mnuchin looks up to Jay Haley. And then when Mnuchin goes to Philadelphia, Jay Haley becomes under Mnuchin. Mnuchin is Jay Haley's boss at this point. So Mnuchin instantly noticed that most of the clients were people of color, and yet most of the staff were mostly white. So instantly, right away, Mnuchin set out to recruit people of color to work there to reflect the clientele. Again, this is way before its time, and we still struggle with that today. And there are there are uh, you know a, a variety of of emphasis on this sort of thing. You know, some agencies try to do this, try to recruit clinicians of color, and some agencies don't at all. And so it's interesting to see again. This is 1965, and he's way before his time, and didn't have to do that, right? I mean, that it 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 adds to your stress. He could have just gone with the status quo, but he didn't. For his training program, he he, at this, so this Philadelphia clinic not only treated families, but was also a training program at, he had a training program at the clinic. And he recreated the situation he had with his colleagues at the Wiltswick School for Boys, in which there was a one-way mirror and there was live observation of other therapists. So he he was like, oh, I, I really liked what we had with me and my colleagues back there. <clears throat> so I, I want to recreate that at this clinic now that I'm director. And so all the therapists were observed for every session. According according to sources that I saw, which I find to be hard to believe, but I guess possible, was that therapists, all family therapists, I think particularly novice therapists, were not only just observed some of the time, but were observed for every single session that they had. <laughs> which... By by at least one supervisor or colleague, and would provide uh, feedback to them. Um, I I don't understand how they do this because again the funding problem. You're not just paying for one clinician; you're paying for two plus f- clinicians for every session. So they must have just had and and these they were working with marginalized families that I assume were not paying for this, or at least not very much paying for it. So they must have just had amazing grants or funding or something. The other thing that I just have to say is that I wonder if it was really boring because there it's it's very exciting to work with families as a family therapist but to watch family therapy all day long it, I think I would get bored there there is just there's you know that's why there's no interesting movies about therapy in general because uh, about ethical therapy I'll say because if you, because I've often thought, like, wouldn't it be interesting? When my early career, I thought, man, someone should make a, a TV show or a movie about what therapy actually is like, because it's really dramatic. So many things are happening. But then when I actually watch other people do therapy, in which amazing things are happening, um, you realize from the outside watching it, it's very boring, and you sometimes it can be very dramatic. But it's very brief, the drama. The, the tension and the excitement is in the room, and you have to be participating in that conversation and in that relationship to really feel that excitement. So to watch family therapy sessions all day long, which I'm guessing Mnuchin did, I'm guessing he you know, watched hours of people doing therapy every day, uh, I just commend him for not getting bored out of his mind. <laughs> um, as someone who who does that occasionally, uh, I just have to say uh, I commend him for that. Um, but you know, he needed to train people because they didn't have family therapy training programs at the time, and so he had to completely rewire these people's brains regarding therapy. And so, um, so you know, he dedicated himself to do that. So this was when Mnuchin, with the help of his colleagues and Jay Haley, they transformed this small clinic in Philadelphia into a world-renowned facility for family therapy, which, which served mostly low-income families. So because of the publications that they were publishing and because of these live demonstrations they were sending out and all the people who were coming in and out there to be trained, this small little clinic uh, became this world-renowned family therapy center. 
1967, he published his uh, one of his main works, his book called Families of the Slums. Families of the Slums. Now, today, that title wouldn't go over quite well politically, but uh, at the time, that it did. He wrote about his experience at the Wiltswick School for Troubled Boys. He wrote about family therapy theory and practice. These ideas would eventually be called structural family therapy, but that label hadn't been applied yet. He wrote in his book that uh, he claimed, uh, so this is when he started to really formalize his ideas into written word. And he was saying that, that you know, when you have a family system that is organized in a dysfunctional way, that pathology results from that. And the purpose of therapy is to change that dysfunctional family system pattern, but you need to disrupt it. You can't just try to change it sort of hap- or softly. You have to really sort of hit it hard to get them off kilter because only then can you disrupt the cybernetics and the feedback that promote homeostasis. This was a totally weird idea at, 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 weird idea at the time, and honestly, is still weird today, which bothers me. His, but you know, it should be pointed out that his that his ideas weren't completely new. You know, this was after other main pioneers like Bateson and Ackerman and Bowen and Whitaker and Lyman Wynn and Naj and and Don Jackson and and other people like that who had already been saying and writing about this. And so, to to, to some extent, Mnuchin was sort of an early adopter of those ideas, shall we say, because uh, he, you know, he went to Palo Alto and, sur- and studied under these people, Jay Haley also. And so he, it's not like he invented these ideas, but he was definitely a very early pioneer. 1974, let's skip forward to that. Um, so in this, you know, 60s, early 70s, he's, you know, gaining popularity, he's publishing, he's selling books, he's giving trainings, he's actually hands-on training with uh, family therapists. So 1974, he's in his 50s now, and he publishes his book, Families and Family Therapy. Families and Family Therapy. It's his most famous book. I think I've owned multiple copies, like, I don't know, at least four copies of this book uh, because I just love buying books from my library. And there was a time when I just didn't have time to organize my library, and so... I didn't realize until I finally just sat down and alphabetized all my books and organized all of them that I realized I had multiple copies of this book. And so I, um, you know, donated the uh, copies that I had to my students, the extra ones. And so now I just have one copy on my shelf. 1975, after two decades, Mnuchin stepped down as the director of the clinic in Philadelphia. But he continued to teach therapists because he, he made himself head of training at the center. So he, he no longer had to be the boss man and instead just had to be head of training, which I totally understand that move, by the way. It's, it's uh, a, analogous to me because I became program director at, at Antioch and um, eventually just said, nah, I, I think I just like teaching and practicing. So <laughs> I'm going to, because when you're a director, you, you're a boss, you're an administrator, you have to schedule people, you have to go to budget meetings and to uh, administration meetings and you talk to lawyers occasionally, you know, it's, it has, you know, more to do with administration and much less to do with teaching and much less to do with actual clinical practice. And so Mnuchin made this move when he was in his 50s. He he said, nah, I don't want to be director anymore. I just want to teach, I want to, and I want to teach the teachers. And so that's what he did. And many people from around the globe came to train with him at the center in Philadelphia in the 70s. You know, because this is before YouTube, before Skype, and before there was an abundance of family therapy training programs like my training program at Antioch. You had to travel to study under someone. And so people would. They would travel from all over the world, go to Philadelphia, and train under him. Okay, skipping forward to the 1980s, he's now in his 60s, and by this point, family therapy had really hit its stride, and it was well known in the field of psychotherapy as as an up-and-coming form of psychotherapy. And structural family therapy had become the most popular form of family therapy. And there was a lot of research, and there was a lot of training, and a lot of 
people began, um, you know, training in other cities. They began, you know, developing other training programs. Graduate programs started cropping up to, to teach Mnuchin's ideas and, and other family therapy ideas. And again, structural family therapy as a term had been established by now, and it was the most popular of all the family therapies. 1981, Mnuchin moved to New York from Philadelphia, and he established yet another institution called the Family Studies Institute. Where so so again, he was working at this clinic as a as a as head of training, but he's like, you know what? I really just want to start my own institute. It's like my own organization. So he moved to New York and, and established the Family Studies Institute, where he and his colleagues continued to teach his model of family therapy, structural family therapy. Later, when he retired in 1995, it was renamed the Mnuchin Center for Family, for the family. Mnuchin Center for the Family. It's kind of cumbersome. <laughs> it should just be called the Mnuchin Center, in my opinion. But anyway, um, and it's still open today, and you can go there today if you want, uh, in New York. So 20, as of 2018, the Mnuchin Center is still there, and you can still go there to be trained in Mnuchin's ways, which is awesome. And so... In 1981, he established this thing, and it's still around. 1983, for some reason, he moved to England and spent one year consulting there. Moved back to New York, 1984, um, and again to his training center, which eventually became the Mnuchin Center. He continued to work on ways to help marginalize families. He did that throughout his career. He tried to motivate other clinicians to help marginalize people. He got grants for long-term projects to work with marginalized people in New York, and so it's really a wonderful testament to his, to his altruism. 1996, this was when I was in graduate school studying his theory. He's now 75 years old, and he and his wife moved to Boston to be closer to their children and grandchildren. So at this point, he's like, eh, I think I want to slow down. I don't want to really run my institute anymore. Um, and this is when they changed the institute to be called the Mnuchin Institute. And he moves to Boston to be closer to his children and grandchildren. But he continued to teach and supervise. He wasn't fully retired yet. Um, and he particularly supervised family therapists doing in-home therapy. So this is interesting because just a year later in 1997, I started doing in-home family therapy myself. I didn't know that he was interested in that. And it, I absolutely understand his attraction to that because if you want to work with marginalized families doing in-home work is really the best way to go because families one have a really hard time you know getting everyone there because you you might have to get on the bus and it costs money but also like there's just so much stress and and you know so many outside stressors that are uh, impinging on 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 marginalized families that forcing them to pack themselves into a into a bus and get themselves to your office is, is a bit of a hardship. Plus, as another thing, as an in-home therapist, you instantly realize the world that these marginalized families live in. Their neighborhoods are sometimes unsafe. They sometimes don't have adequate um, facilities in their in the apartment they live in, uh, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, Mnuchin was very interested in that. Okay. 1998. Again, he's in his he's in his late 70s here. This was um, when something interesting kind of happened, and something that Mnuchin has become known for, which is interesting because he's in his late career at this point and has done so much great work. But for whatever reason, a lot of people when they think of Mnuchin, they think about this event that happened in 1998. So at the time, in the late 90s, post what what's called postmodern therapy, postmodern family therapy was becoming very popular among family therapists. Theories in this category are narrative therapy, solution-focused therapy, uh, social constructionism, cultural relativism, feminism, cybernetics of cybernetics, etc. Um, I remember this. I remember this movement in the late 90s. It was sort of like the new thing, the new kid on the block, shall we say, <laughs> to use parlance of the time. And I remember, I, I didn't really understand it very well, but uh, I was just kind of sticking to my, the, my, to my object relations systems, uh, interpersonal theories myself. But I remember narrative therapy, solution-focused therapy becoming really popular among family therapists. And I remember being a little annoyed with them. So, I, so because Mnuchin basically spoke out against this group and, 
And it's, it's again, a sort of a black mark on his career. But I just want to give some context to, to it. Um, because I, too, remember being a little annoyed with these postmodernists because they were so adamant about how awesome their theory was. And they were so adamant about how stupid everyone else was for not being postmodern. Uh, I had a colleague at in in my very first job at the very first agency I worked at, and I really liked him. I can't remember his name. I wish I remember his name because then I could kind of look him up on LinkedIn or something and connect with him. But he he was staunchly postmodern. He was um, solution focused, I believe. And he and and I actually did co therapy with him. We had clients together, and so we would we would work side by side with clients. And here I am doing my interpersonal psychodynamic systems work, and he's doing, his, which is a complete opposite theory to just straight up solution focus theory. And he, he would often try to recruit me. It felt very cultish around the time, postmodern. You know, when I had my, my ideas of psychodynamic object relations and systems theory, I didn't really care about anyone else believing the things I believed. I just didn't care. But a lot of the postmodern people, when you talk to them back then, and, and to some extent now, they they seem like they're trying to recruit you. <laughs> they're trying to convince you something. They're, and, and they're basically like, oh, really? Psychodynamic work, huh? Interesting that you're following that. Well, you know, uh, do you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of attitude. Whereas, you know, I would never, I would never look at a solution focused person and be like, well, you know, interesting theory you're following there. And I would never do that. You know, everyone's entitled to be attracted to what they want to be attracted to. But anyway, so, you know, it's just anecdotal for me. I just remember being a little annoyed with it. Well, Mnuchin was annoyed with it too, apparently, because he famously had criticism about postmodern therapy. And um, like I said, it was kind of a bad political move and it became sort of a black mark in his, in his late career. So in 1998, in an editorial in the Journal of, of Marital and Family Therapy, which is a major journal in, in systems theory. He, although, so, so he, he praised narrative therapy and solution-focused therapy because it brought some good contributions to the field, but he also wrote that he didn't like postmodern therapies because they de-emphasized the importance of the therapist too much. You know, he, he thought that the therapist needed to be in the room and needed to really be a part of the situation. And postmodern therapies directly tried to de-emphasize the therapist's importance. Um, postmodern, postmodern therapists really tried to even out the hierarchy, you know, because they were saying, what do we know? We don't know anything. No one knows anything. And, and how, could a, how could a therapist claim to know things when no one knows anything? You know, um, Mnuchin thought that this was denying our responsibility as therapists. He also thought the postmodern therapies denied the experience of the family. He didn't think it was possible to change the cultural narrative of families. Now, I just want to say it's complicated, and I could talk for hours and hours about this. You know, some of Mnuchin's um, thoughts are a bit of a straw man about postmodern therapy, but there is some truth to it as well, particularly the way some people practiced it. Um, so anyway... Now, in my opinion, Mnuchin was wrong to actually write about it in this way. Post postmodern writers, in my opinion, in family therapy have raised some very legitimate con criticisms about all the therapies that we use in psychotherapy. You know, at the time and even today, therapists often deny their contributions to the system. You know, they will say like, "Well, there's the family system, there's the client, and then there's me, and I'm an I'm, a, I'm an objective observer of the client. I know what's happening. The client needs to be told what's happening. You know, it's a very top down thing, and and it, and it comes from a perspective that the therapist has an objective hold on reality, which is, according to postmodern ideas, ridiculous, and according to me, ridiculous. So. Um, now, having said all that, I will say that I've basically, um, I don't go as far as postmodern, you know, you know, purists in that saying, like, um, as I know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> but I will say that everything I think has to be questioned severely because there's just no way to know that what I'm thinking is accurate or not. Um, but I think that you can balance out structural family therapy and postmodern ideas. But, but at the time, they were very polarized. Um, also, all this criticism of psychotherapy was in line with 
contemporary feminism ideas at times. You know, our, our patriarchal system promotes a very top-down mindset that is oppressive to everyone, especially women, and that needed to be questioned. And postmodernism was a movement that that questioned that from a feminist perspective. And also, there was a pretty big criticism from postmodernists and feminists that structural family therapy might be promoting male dominance and patriarchy in families by, by in a sense, often being biased towards men being at the top of the hierarchy and being in control. And although that wasn't explicitly what Mnuchin was teaching, that is often what was being promoted by structural family therapists, apparently. So, so there was this, so uh, Mnuchin published a couple editorials that were really quite famous and I think uh, furthered the divide between postmodernists and, and so-called non-postmodernists. And also, you know, he's in his late career, he's in his late seventies and it just, it made him, it sort of tainted his overall career. I wish, personally, I wish he never would have said anything. I wish he would have just kept his ideas to himself on, on this one, or at least tried to take a little bit more time to figure out uh, what was happening and, and, and how to word it. And, and really, you know, M- Mnuchin definitely operated from a so-called mod- modernist perspective of therapy. He definitely was a little antithetical to postmodern ideas. He wasn't any different from anyone else at the time, by the way, so it's not like he was particular. He was he was totally right standard in the middle of psychotherapy at the time. But, you know, the way he talked, he definitely talked as if he knew what was happening in the family. He definitely talked as if he had had an objective hold on reality. Um, there, was, there wasn't enough emphasis on countertransference, in my opinion, and following in, in his example, a lot of structural family therapists, in my opinion, when I have observed structural family therapists, they often come across as, as at least a little, if not a, a lot, judgmental of families, as if the therapist starts with this assumption that the family is wrong and that the therapist knows how the family should be acting. Um, but again, this is how everyone is acting back then. And and that was honestly what trainees were looking for, you know, that the field was looking toward major figures to provide them with confidence and security in the knowledge that our field has something to say and, and is scientific, so to speak. Um, so there's that. So I think there's a number of factors that contributed to uh, Salvador Mnuchin's blunder at this point. <clears throat> Number one, when he wrote this, he was in his late seventies, and and I don't want to be ageist, but I just want to say that at the time, you know, uh, at, it's at, in your late seventies, it's not like you're super open to new ideas, right? You you've had decades of experience that tell you one thing, and then all of a sudden this this other thing comes along, and you're just like, eh, I don't know. So so I think that's one factor. Number two. You know, a, a, a strange new radical theory emerges, and it completely is designed to dismantle the entire field of psychotherapy. And taken to its extreme, which some postmodernists did, they basically were saying psycho the entire field of psychotherapy is a sham. You know, uh, based on our ideas, we we make a compelling argument that therapists know nothing and. They're just tricking themselves into thinking they think th- into thinking they know things, and many of these postmodernists were aggressively attacking all therapies, most notably Mnuchin's theory, because it was mainly within family therapy. The postmodernists were had, had a big following in the family therapy world, and since Mnuchin was at the top of the of of that pyramid, the postmodernists attacked Mnuchin a lot. And this is a theory that Mnuchin had been working on his entire life. And they were basically saying that Mnuchin's theory was completely false and useless, um, and and they still do. Some of them still do. Number three, I'm guessing that Mnuchin was surrounded by a lot of yes people, and so Mnuchin, as he started to complain about postmodernism, I'm guessing that a lot of his followers were like, "Yeah, you're right, Mnuchin. You're you know." So it's just a it's just speculation. Number four, I'm guessing that he just didn't get postmodernist ideas and. He wrote about it without thinking about it further. I mean, some of his writing seems to um, show that, that he didn't really understand what it meant really. Uh, Again, just a speculation there. He was a smart guy, but 
uh, it's a hard thing to grasp, particularly if you're a little hostile to the ideas. And number five, I'm guessing that he thought it was a fad and that it would die out. It was it was new. It, there was a very small group of people that were that were uh, you know purists about it. And I'm just thinking he thought, well, you know, might as well stamp this out because it's another. And the other thing is, I'm thinking is like, how many other random theories sort of cropped up that Mnuchin spoke out against that were fads? Because uh, you've got to figure there had to have been a lot of fads that came out in his lifetime. And I'm thinking he just like, eh, this is another stupid fad. And I'll, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll speak out against it. You know, okay. the other thing was, was that it wasn't like Mnuchin was alone in this criticism. There were a lot of people that were, um, have, you know, th- the fact that they published this in a journal uh, shows that s- some people thought this voice needed to be heard. But anyway. So this is a sort of black mark on his reputation, particularly among the so-called postmodern people. By the way, as I've said before, I don't like the term postmodern to be used this way because when you actually study postmodernism as a philosophy, it's it's much more complicated and and different than that. So whenever I categorize these theories, I use the term brief or collaborative because I think, particularly collaborative, I think collaborative definitely um, encapsulates its essence, and I, I and we don't have to call upon the fancy word of postmodernism to to describe it. Now, having said all that, Mnuchin he absolutely did talk about respecting the family, even though you definitely could call his theory a modernist theory. He definitely talked about making the family um, under, try, really trying to understand the family's culture and not making assumptions about it. He talked about how therapists needed to revise their theories and their hypotheses and not fall in love with their initial ideas about what's happening. He talked about how systems of power outside the family affected things. So in many ways, he was already basically postmodern integrated before that was a thing. So, okay. All right, skipping forward to 2004. He's now 83 years old. He moves to Florida to retire. But he continued teaching and writing. (laughs) So... It's like he's doing all these moves, these slow moves towards retirement, but you know he keeps holding on to teaching and writing. And honestly, I hope that's what my career is like in my 80s. I would love to slow down and but continue teaching and, and retiring. And I see a lot of my colleagues at Antioch doing this. They will cut back on their hours at Antioch. They'll cut back on their hours in their practice, but they never can really let go, even if they're in their mid-80s. Um, all right, 2013, age 92, he criticized the movement in family therapy training to teach theory over experiential learning. So he wanted novice therapist trainees to have more experiences with one-way mirrors like he did in his training programs. And because what he was observing was a lot of training programs in marriage and family therapy were focusing on reading a lot of stuff, on writing papers and other academic work. And he was like, look, being a good family therapist means to become a good family therapist, you have to do family therapy and you have to be observed and you have to be, you have to get feedback from other therapists. Um, and honestly, I totally agree with Mnuchin on this. So, so this is recent. Again, this is just five years ago. He was criticizing our field for this. Um, and in my program, I have to say we're guilty of that to some extent. I mean, we definitely have a lot of experiential training. And in my guess, we have more than uh, not my guess, actually. I know um, we're at least at par with other training programs, but I, I do know we actually have more experiential learning than other institutions do. You know, it's generally avoided in training programs and in, in master's programs and doctoral programs because it's terrifying to both teachers and students because it's much easier to lecture or watch a movie or have people talk about, you know, their reactions to a reading or a sign up a paper to write or something. Those are those are anxiety provoking anyway. But for people to actually uh, be, be in a, a, a observation fishbowl tank, students are terrified of that. I was terrified of it when I was a student. You know, to sit. I, w- I was terrified of it as a teacher when I would actually have to demonstrate therapy in my early teaching career and have students watch me do therapy. It was terrifying to me. It's not terrifying to me anymore, but it was back in the day. And so I think that's a reason why people avoid it. It's just like, ah, that's scary. <laughs> um, also, it's totally not emphasized by accreditors and state licensing board. The 
then it's it's they're they're they've made some adjustments to the accreditors and the state licensing boards to add direct observation to their requirements, but it's not um, emphasized enough. Let's just put it that way. Also, it would add a lot of expense. A lot of money would have to be spent on that because, in order to observe someone, you you presumably someone has to be compensated to do that, and that's pretty expensive. You know, a typical supervisor will meet with their supervisee once a once a week for an hour. So you only have to pay the supervisor for one hour a week. Well, to provide direct observation the way that Mnuchin did it, you would you would have to have at least one supervisor paid to observe multiple therapists over multiple hours, which would just be extremely expensive in today's world. Uh, also, facilities would have to be built. I mean, you'd have to have rooms with one-way mirrors. Th- that's expensive, right? Uh, every therapy office would have to have some abilities that people from the outside could, could watch in. And that's really expensive and annoying to um, people who own facilities. They're just like, really? You, you need us to build a one-way mirror? Really? Like, come on. And we actually had one in our old building at Antioch, which we just moved out of a year ago. And I remember when we built it uh, in 98, 97, the, the whole idea, Paul David, who, my mentor who was in charge of the pro, family therapy program at the time and was for many years, he, I think, built that one-way mirror thing because he wanted to follow in Mnuchin's example and others. But we never used it, to my knowledge, or very rarely, or only in the beginning a couple times, because it's a total pain in the butt, you know? At the university, it, because um, it, there's no support for this and no funding for it, we would have to, if, if from my memory, what Paul David did in the beginning was he's like, okay, people at their internship will bring a client from their internship agency to the university, and then Paul and other people will observe this intern student working with this family behind a one-way mirror. You know, any any clinician listening out there knows that that's extremely logistically difficult. One, you have to find a family who's willing to do it. Two, you have to get the family to the university. (laughs) Three, the agency has to sign off on that. The agency has to be like, sure, yeah, take a family out of our agency and go to this random university. You know, it's just this red tape nightmare. And so so anyway, Mnuchin, at the age of 92, just five years ago, was writing and and criticizing the fact that we don't do that anymore, Um, which... Is interesting. He was still relevant at the age of 92. Okay, so skipping forward to 2017, he died at the age of 97-ish, and he died in he died on October 30th, 2017. So not that long ago, in Florida, from complications from Parkinson's. So that's his life. Argentina, big family, political strife, Israel, war, children being traumatized, the United States, marginalized children and their families, Nathan Ackerman, New York, Harry Stack Sullivan, Philadelphia. He developed structural family therapy with his colleagues, goes to Palo Alto, Jay Haley, Besties. His theory and uh, film de- his film demonstrations become really popular in the 60s. He tours around the world, inspiring people to focus on the family. He helps create the entire profession of marriage and family therapy. Marriage and family therapy becomes an actual separate profession that's separate from psychology and counseling and social work. Um, in the 90s, I, I go to an open house at Antioch to learn more about the master's program, and I learn about marriage and family therapy, and I'm convinced by Paul David to become a marriage and family therapist because I... I absolutely want to work with individuals, but I'm also very compelled by the idea of working with couples and families. I get trained as an as an MFT. I get trained in structural family therapy. I learn about Mnuchin. I watch his, his tapes in the 90s. I eventually teach his theory to students after I graduate, and then I develop a podcast, and people email me to talk about Mnuchin, and I finally get the time to do that. I do a deep dive on him and his theory, and here we are. So let's talk about his theory. Uh, I'm going to do a deep dive on Salvador Mnuchin's theory, structural family therapy. I'm going to talk about why we, why it's so popular, 
what did he find to be useful when he was working with families? Why did he find it useful? How do people use structural family ther- theory today? What are the different concepts in it? Um, and, and I have a lot of things to say about this because a number of his ideas have been completely altered and distorted. Things like joining and reframing are very popular words in family therapy. And in my experience, 99% of the time, people don't know what they actually mean. And to know what they actually mean is to know what family therapy is. And to distort, the way people distort these words is basically antithetical to family therapy in some ways. So anyway, I'm going to talk about that. Um, Why do people have problems in their relationships according to structural family therapy, which I think structural family therapy definitely provides answers as to why some people suffer in their life and why some people suffer in their relationships with the people that they're in relationship with. And I'm also going to talk about the, th- the practice, you know, how, how do structural family therapists actually help people? So uh, as I said before, the rest of this episode is just for patrons of the podcast. So if you're, lis- if you're listening to this now and you're not a patron yet, this episode is going to end now. If you want to hear the full episode in which I go into the theory, you have to become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. That's patreon.com. When you become a patron, you get access to this episode and hundreds of other patron-exclusive episodes in which we do deep dives into various topics like like Mnuchin and and other people and other theories and ideas and everything. And when you become a patron, you don't have to listen to the vast majority of commercials. And remember that a portion of your monthly pledge goes toward various charities that we support. (laughs) 